Thanks, uh, I'm Adam Gugolicello. I'm a solutions engineer for Datamere. Uh, a couple of quick level set questions. Uh, who all has used Hadoop? All right, so it's pretty, uh, sometimes I get a lot of folks who have showed up to see what it is all about, so good, I'll just set that level. Um, who all knows who Datamere is? All right, so I will set that one. Uh, <laughs> um, so Datamere is a BI tool. We live on top of Hadoop, we do everything native map reduce. Uh, what it provides, and, and in my role as a solutions engineer, I get to see a lot of folks trying to use Hadoop, trying to use Datamere uh, to actually solve problems. Uh, I see a lot of use cases specifically aimed at the business users. And the reason for that is because Datamere is a BI platform with a spreadsheet interface designed to run natively in Hadoop using MapReduce and HDFS storage. So what it provides us is the ability to sort of expand the uh, use cases out of IT running log processing or doing collaborative filtering or trying to do random forest analysis uh, in their uh, in their data sets uh, to folks who are really trying to enmesh uh, data that has traditionally been difficult to enmesh um, to uh, discover relationships in the data that aren't necessarily ML uh, but things that you can just see by sort of filtering and, and uh, scanning the data. And so the talk tonight is some of those use cases. What have I seen folks doing? Uh, I've got a couple slides that sort of take, through, take you through uh, the base use case, how they went about it. I'll tell you some anecdotes about um, sort of what their problem space is and, and what they've seen. Uh, and if there's an interest, uh, and at the end we've had some time, I can give you guys a brief demonstration of data mirror, although I will try to keep it uh, as not salesy as possible. Uh, despite my sort of mandate from Datamere to be salesy, uh, I, I will try to keep it engineering. Uh, any questions before I get started? Great. So, uh, there, uh, I like to put it this way, there are roughly five use cases that people use Hadoop for. Um, and there are all sort of variations on Oh, yeah, all right, am I, am I really not that loud? Okay, that better? Yeah. All right, Great. fine. Um, so there's really about five use cases that folks use Hadoop for. Um, and you know, sort of writ large, they are log processing, data quality analysis, uh, uh, data integration, trying to bring together disparate data sources, um, looking for fraud <laughs> patterns, looking for outliers in their data, um, and managing their archives. Uh, so writ large, there's about five use cases. They're all sort of embarrassingly parallel. They're somewhat embarrassingly parallel because they've been the same five use cases that Parallel Compute has been doing for 20 years. But um, what we have seen is that increasingly with Hadoop, uh, folks are being able to sort of expand away from that original set of five use cases and start to see more and more sort of corner cases and edge cases uh, emerging as the business folks who traditionally were not technical enough to get their hands into a platform compute now have access to more data, right? It's the old uh, Google, you know, we don't have better models, we just have more data. Uh, and increasingly what we have seen is business users being able to pull together uh, disparate data sets, data sets or data sets that were too large to fit in a relational model uh, are being able to explore sort of new use cases in the, uh, specifically the financial space. And I'm based in New York, so the vast majority of my customer constituency is either pharma, uh, telco, or finance. So, um, I don't have it here, this is a little annoying because it was in the original deck, but um, I'll give a problem statement that Datamere is really trying to solve, uh, and it's the old ETL problem space. Uh, it's the six to eight weeks to get new data delivered and modeled, and anytime a business user traditionally wanted to get some new piece of data delivered or re-aggregated or summarized differently, they'd pick up the phone, they'd call someone in IT and say, listen, I, I really need uh, our authorizations data tied to our transaction and clearances data because I'm looking for geolocated fraud patterns. Uh, and invariably, the response they would get would be, that's a six to eight week project, uh, do you have a budget? And the answer to that would be, uh, well, no, I'll pull in favors and I'll call up folks in IT and I will get a data mark delivered that I will then make a copy of in Excel and uh, wind up pushing around ancient Excels and PowerPoints that the business then makes decisions on. Sound familiar? <laughs> uh, 
Uh, and so what, uh, what data mirrors looking to do is really you used to do load the data raw, build your life finding schema, stop trying to stop trying to decide which model is up front, um, and put the put the power of Hadoop in the end user's hands. And so some of the things that have come out of that, uh, and the sort of first and foremost in the financial space has been compliance, um, especially with folks doing uh, sort of responding to Dodd Frank um, and responding to uh, some of the increased scrutiny around value of risk um, and what they're seeing with regards to the quality of their data. And uh, a number of the big banks, uh, one of the large retail banks based in the Southeast, um, one of the uh, large uh, retail IB and treasury banks, um, all of these guys suddenly have been faced with, uh, especially on the heels of 2008, a large array of data sets of which they have very little knowledge of the confidence level in that data. Uh, what are the source systems delivering as far as confidence goes? Uh, what's the overall percentage of records that fall outside of our level of quality? Uh, and how is that trending over time? Uh, at least one of them created a chief risk officer that was responsible for reporting to the street and to the SEC the level of compliance and data quality that was coming from 250 uh, relational data stores, uh, most of which were acquired um, in the big shuffle that happened at the end of 2008, um, and a lot of it around uh, loan, loan data. Uh, so suddenly they have 250 data sources coming from everything like FoxPro, uh, from the uh, legacy loan processing system who shall remain names to uh, their own systems, to a number of other banks that they have acquired, um, and needed the ability to sort of quickly model these together, uh, execute a whole bunch of data quality tests at scale, store that data in perpetuity um, so that they could had all of their audit trails as to what were the set of checks we were checking in against uh, in March versus June versus July, um, and be able to quickly and easily implement a whole mess roughly 500 at last count, uh, data quality checks for things like, uh, is the FICO score less than 200 and greater than 800? Is the LTV greater than the loan uh, total value uh, greater than 0.8? Uh, and the uh, FICO score less than 600, um, so the rate should be greater than N. Uh, and looking for, essentially, how many bad records are we getting month over month? Um, is that spiking, so we need to raise a bunch of alerts? have somebody go beat up the original source system um, because it's suddenly barfing. Did we suddenly get new domains of data showing up uh, in quality, you know, in columns that we expected, five, six, ten values in, suddenly there's 15 in. Um, and they needed to sort of do the ad hoc uh, analysis as well. So, all right, we saw a 6% increase in bad records coming from source system one, seven, and nine. Why? What are they? What are the profile of those records? So in addition to sort of creating that ongoing uh, dashboard of the quality of the data, they need to be able to sort of do forensics on that and decompose that. Um, and at the end of the day, these reports end up at the top of the house reports. They get reported to the CRO, <coughs> Chief Risk Officer, and to the street. Uh, so I don't lose the thread. Anybody have any questions on that, thoughts, comments? We'll go a little deeper, like so. So I'm starting out with a whole bunch of disparate data tables, right? Yep. And and that are they putting them in then, or I mean, like some of them, so you're querying them, taking this stuff and putting it into the What's the stuff that goes into the What okay. point am I? Uh, so I'll, I'll back it up. Uh, so 250 data sources arriving from whatever the head relational data store they were on are being ingested with some combination of data mirror and scoop. They are being ingested unchanged and landed in. Hadoop. Uh, at that point, they're using data mirror to provide the normalization and joins. So uh, untreated raw records land. Uh, they have a series of workbooks that do things like cleanse the keys, um, you know, build composite keys, separate out various columns uh, to normalize the data. Uh, and then that data is then having uh, sort of two sets of workbooks run on them. One is how much data quality is there month over month. And the second is what are the bad records and what do they look like? So what are the ones that are bouncing because uh, they're not being adjusted properly, they're not shaped right, or they fail, uh, and sort of creating a fork for that data. Does that make sense? Well, okay, so maybe I can, so I start out with like 250 data. Yep. 
uh, I put them into Vimeo and Scoop, and then they come out into one giant table stored in Duke. No, the 250 tables stored okay. in Hadoop. Um, and then they get drawn down into several sort of subsequent tables. Uh, they really we were very concerned about the data lineage, and they wanted to make sure that no point in the transformation was lost so that they could decompose that for auditors. Um, so, you know, five tables that are related uh, get joined together and normalized into uh, another materialized set, so that sort of gets materialized back in HGFS. Um, and it, it sort of turns into March Madness. You know, you get five of them to one, five to one, five to one, five to one, and you get another set of brackets. Make sense? Uh, and so what they're really concerned with is uh, really a match of data management being done on top of it. Awesome. It's pretty straightforward. Um, they were able to greatly reduce their Netiza footprint um, uh, and drive roughly three weeks out of every delivery of new data source from the modeling um, and uh, risk reporting um, down to about two days to deliver a new data source. So uh, I don't know, who all here went to uh, Hadoop World in uh, 2011? Which one? Uh, one in New York. Okay. Yeah. Um, so one of the big investment banks got up and talked about how they had built a fraud detection system, um, and specifically looking for asset movements between portfolios um, where a large number of movements had been made in losing positions um, in an attempt to obfuscate losses. Uh, traditionally, these systems were difficult to model together. The positions and trade systems were very, very large, um, and they also wanted to be able to look for uh, accounts that a given trading desk shouldn't have had access to. Essentially what they were looking for is folks hiding losses. Um, and they were able to in, uh, again, uh, so landing, uh, using in this case um, uh, Flume to load a whole bunch of log data being dumped out of um, the message driven uh, trading systems, land that in Hadoop and begin to model together the set of positions uh, with the set of asset movements, we're able to analyze that for the first time uh, by putting that in the hands of the uh, bankers as opposed to the technologists uh, and look for what were dangerous patterns uh, and not in a way that requires writing uh, big fraud detection an analytics, but in a way that simply requires uh, filtering on where this has happened more than five times, really doing forensics on the underlying. Uh, and they found something on the order of $1.2 million in the first day that they turned it on uh, that was hidden, uh, hidden losses that uh, some trading desk had been shuffling around trying to hide in the, uh, in the event that it would uh, recover and that it wouldn't come uh, and be exposed. As you can imagine, a fair number of folks are really uh, sensitive to this uh, in the wake of some of the things we've seen recently. Um, and I think you'll see a, a sort of common trend in these cases, but it, they really involve end users being able to bring the large data sets together, um, transform them themselves, change the aggregation levels that they need uh, on demand. Uh, and then, re in this case, uh, set it up as policy. So they were able to very quickly translate the set of sort of forensic anal analytics they had done to positions and asset movements uh, into something that they ran nightly and look for, essentially, you know, what are my targets for uh, looking for bad movements or, or bad noise. Um, and then they use this, uh, in this case, to feed a training set for their uh, fraud detection predictive analytics. So they wanted to uh, use what came out of this to feed a classification algorithm uh, to essentially detect other similar movements in the future. Questions? Great. All right. Is this what you guys want to hear? Do you want me to decompose it in a different direction? I'm happy to pivot. All right. Um, so I'm sure you all guys are all aware that there's a huge amount. Actually, let me back up one more. I mentioned one of the other banks that we've been dealing with. Um, 
rather than looking for trade patterns, was looking for wire transfer analytics. Um, they wanted to find everywhere where they were handling money that they weren't the counterparty um, on either side of it. Um, so, uh, the, the back up. We handle a bunch of money, it moves to wire transfers. In many cases, the party on both sides is a customer of this bank, um, somewhere in their hierarchy, right? So uh, party A is shipping party, money to party B. Uh, party A is a direct customer of this bank. Party B is a customer of this bank, three levels up their corporate hierarchy. Um, so we need to map the corporate hierarchy to identify, uh, sort of walk that tree to identify what is the uh, you know, utmost root parent <coughs> Um, to try to identify is this wire transfer that uh, is not using <coughs> our bank to transfer money someplace where we could be handling that money for them. Um, so essentially navigate the set of, of, identify all the asset movements, identify the counterparties, identify relationships with those counterparties, and target places where we can send our salesmen back to go and uh, sell them uh, perhaps a different wire transfer service. Or potentially different. Uh, and I think, and they weren't explicit about this, uh, but I think they had one of the TLA organizations in Washington ask them to look for strange patterns of wire transfers. Um, they alluded to that, but didn't clarify on that. So uh, there may also be a uh, drug laundering uh, or a money laundering case to be made there, but that was not the one. Uh, SLA analytics, of course, this is easy to do for your services, right? Um, look for every place where we have uh, web services that are responding slowly. Um, from an IT standpoint, that makes a lot of sense. From a bank-to-bank uh, -bank or B2B trading system, this is extremely important uh, because most of the banks that are laboring under SLAs traditionally have not been able to report their own SLAs for trade execution. Um, and so what they wind up doing is sort of answering to whatever their client is reporting as trade execution times. So uh, for example, Morgan Stanley Smith Barney is executing trades for Citibank. Um, Citibank, uh, they have agreed to a uh, three millisecond trade execution SLA. Um, they had no real idea of what, at what point the whole fixed message uh, set of mess, and I'll cover that in a little bit, finally worked out as far as the end customer was uh, concerned. And so they sort of wait for City to come back and say, well, these 50 trades took six seconds to execute. We expected 0.3 seconds. Uh, we would like this much money back. And they traditionally had no ability to navigate those trades, um, to those trade messages to determine really how long it took. Uh, where was the bottleneck? Um, was it a bottleneck in the settlement or the, uh, uh, you know, um, the back office processing? Is it our problem? Is it TTCC's problem? Is it your problem, City? Um, so they were able to actually build SLA analytics from the fixed messages to determine actually how long uh, the, uh, the trade execution took. Um, on their systems before it was dispatched to the parents' house uh, and be able to sort of negotiate over uh, you know, responses from their customers to say, you know, yeah, those 60 trades happened, but we had dispatched them according to SLAs. The delay you saw as a client was because a clearinghouse had a bottleneck. Um, and again, in this case, uh, it's log processing. Uh, in this case, they were using Flume to do the log processing. Fixed messages are a hairy mess. Does anybody know what fixed messages are? A couple few. Uh, so it's the financial information exchange protocol. Uh, and essentially, you get a trade done. Uh, a given trade request can turn into something like 1,000 to 2,000 to 10,000 messages. Um, and I'll decompose that in a little bit, but it essentially turns into bid request, quote, quote request, partial fill, partial fill, partial fill, replace request, I want to get it at a different price, partial fill, partial fill. Bill, replace request, um, and then somebody cancels it and unwinds the whole thing. But um, long and short is 
there's this whole hierarchy of messages that these messages relate to, um, and decomposing that is fairly difficult in a standard relational model. You wind up having to build uh, lots of recursive calls back to join the grandfather parent to its set of children, 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 and we're talking about terabytes of these messages being delivered a day. So it was simply something that could not be done um, unless you were delivering extremely expensive uh, MVP platforms. And I will talk a little bit about that when I talk about dark pool sounding. Uh, any questions on this? Thoughts, comments? I mean, this is a lot of processing, right? I talked about there's five use cases. There's five use cases. I mean, Hadoop does really a couple of things very well. A lot of processing for distributed events is one of them. Fraud analytics, I don't have a lot of, uh, I don't have a ton of detail around what the um, actual algorithms were, but I do have an anecdote here. So uh, among our customers are the two biggest credit card processors in the world. Um, one of them, I, I know the numbers, is 250 trillion transact, uh, authorizations done a year. Uh, that, that's every time you swipe the card, they determine whether or not you can you know, make the purchase. There's a second part of that transaction is a clearance, uh, at which point that money is actually seized from your account. So 250 trillion authorizations comes out to something on the order of 10 trillion clearances a year. Um, and based on the volumes of these two data sets, they have never been able to bring them together in any meaningful way. They've been able to sample them, run statistical analyses on them, look for, uh, look for outliers in overall price, uh, you know, overall purchase, uh, look for patterns in utilization, look for bucketing, and, and, uh, and try to do some uh, analysis of, of sort of uh, what are the likely things that this user is doing based on past behavior. Um, but what they were able to do for the first time with Hadoop was bring together this authorization and clearance data and then geolocate it to determine if I authorized this card in Albany and it cleared to Nigeria, that's very likely not a real transaction. Um, and again, because of the volumes and the difficulty of modeling these data sets together before, they were never able to build a model that was anything other than sample driven <coughs> statistics. And in this case, they were able to build a number of hard and fast rules around um, simply denying clearances and rolling back clearances where they couldn't prove that there was a, um, a reason for that clearance to be going somewhere else, a corporate headquarters or a clearance bank uh, that was associated with the account. Um, and, you know, something to that effect. Um, and then they used that as a trading set for a large number of other statistical models. I'm sorry, sir. Does that not also involve a difference of time, maybe a couple of days? Not necessarily. <coughs> um, Can you repeat the question? Yeah, so the question was, does that uh, does not also indicate a, a difference in time in a couple of days? Um, so generally under the hood, that's what's happening anyway. <coughs> <laughs> so you get about two days for clearances to really hit your credit card, right? Um, so that's their SLA anyway. Uh, for being able to block a transaction, and they get something like a 10-day grace window to roll back any transactions that they want. Uh, but they were doing these nightly. They, they had something on the order of a 600-node cluster with uh, uh, 7,500 CPUs, uh, total storage of uh, currently replicated thrice. Um, they have current total storage of four petabytes. Um, yeah, it's, it's not a toy cluster, it's just not fooling around. They, <laughs> they built a real cluster um, and had plans to grow that. They also actually have two clusters. They have a DR cluster as well. I'll talk about that a little bit when I talk about their uh, infrastructure and cost reduction. But uh, yeah, it was okay for them. Um, you know, they already had weird rules around you know, transactions that are older than end days and smaller than Y dollars always pay it because there's no way we can meaningfully do any sort of uh, analytics on it um, once it gets out of our six-day window that lives in a relational model. So they were able to uh, sort of upend a lot of their business models by moving to Hadoop. Um, cool. Yeah. Um, 
Um, yeah, and they, they said something on the order they anticipated a $50 million reduction in shrinkage um, by being able to prevent fraud up front uh, just by essentially uh, supplementing their existing models with this new geolocation analysis. Uh, this is the 360 uh, view of the customer. Uh, we've all heard that, yeah, it's the sort of marketing, we have wanted this forever, how do we find out everything we know about this customer and use it to position products to them? Um, well, now for the first time they can do that. So within some concerns around uh, Treasury, IV, and retail never being able to talk, at least the retail bank um, can really start to do some scoring around, all right, well, he's got a credit line of credit with us, he's got a, a, a bank account with us, he's got an outstanding loan with us. Um, the recurring, uh, recurring deposit that has been happening in his, uh, in his uh, checking account has stopped happening. Uh, his average balance on his credit uh, credit card has dramatically increased in the last uh, month and a half, and uh, our current scoring system keeps telling us that we should refi his loan uh, when he probably has lost his job, uh, and that's probably not the best thing that we should be doing. Uh, so what they were really looking to do was build a number of uh, essentially recommendations that they could push forward to uh, to the website in something like GageBase. Um, so using Hadoop to populate uh, a NoSQL database um, with what is the current set of recommendations that we want to offer to this user. Is it uh, you know a second mortgage? Is it a refi? Is it some oh, or is it potentially you want to decrease the outstanding credit limit because we now believe this user is a bad risk profile. Um, so similarly in the uh, document recommendation space, uh, we've been working with some of the folks who do research uh, for the market space, uh, trying to identify some collaborative filtering to identify uh, readership behaviors in uh, folks who are making trades um, based on something they read at our site. Uh, challenge there is that they don't get to know anything about the readership for 30 days. Um, and then they get to know a little bit more about the readership 60 days later. And then they get to know a little bit more about the readership 90 days later uh, because of some of the uh, antitrust and, and uh, 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 inside trading concerns. It's all staggered so that they can't change their research to affect the market. Um, so they needed essentially to be able to create sort of sliding partitions for that data in a very similar way. Um, in this case, not risk profiling, but sort of target profiling. Um, based on sort of disparate events, laid out disparate systems um, that are arriving sort of later in time and coalesce that into a single sort of what do we do with this user. Um, and again, use the data mirror for this with Hadoop under the hood. Um, in this case, uh, in the second case, using Hadoop, uh, Mahout to do the collaborative filtering. Um, so data mirror was aggregating the data, um, collecting it, allowing for late arriving data uh, that's happening 30, 60, to 90 days later, so that it uh, gets essentially appended to the partition of data that's uh, associated with that readership event, um, and then delivering that information to Mahout to do a uh, to do a collaborative filter and essentially identify other articles that are likely to cause a trade based on that. And operational archiving, this is the one I have the best numbers for. Um, so again, credit card company, 250 trillion transactions happening, um, uh, authorization is happening, 10 trillion uh, clearance is happening, um, PCI requirements and SOX requirements that require them to keep their data for seven years. So uh, giant, giant piles of data, seven requirements to keep it for seven years. We don't have a dupe yet, what do we do? We tape it, we tape it. And Retape it every six months, and uh, if tape formats change, and uh, we missed a taping cycle, there's a good chance we lose some data. Um, uh, we uh, we have DR that is not meaningful um, in our living systems and systems that are you know, at their edge point for scaling. Uh, again, I mentioned it earlier: X days, Y dollars, always pay it because our archives are dead. 
to us uh, because the cost of staging tapes is massive. So uh, they were paying $27,800 to store one terabyte of data year over year, including taping and retaping and managing tapes and uh, with tape scale dealing with that. Standing up two Hadoop clusters um, where all source data lands in both of them for DR uh, in disparate uh, uh, locations. They were able to reduce their overall storage costs from $27,800 to $300 per terabyte per year including all of the requirements for replacing disks, replacing machines, um, and suddenly their archives are living. So now they can do stuff with them, like you know, actually query records that are older than 10 days and small than my dollars and not pay them if they aren't properly. Um, and yeah, so you know, super easy to do. Archives, everybody's favorite do uh, dollar sign use case for delivering value to, uh, to Hadoop. Uh, to the business, um, and these guys made it very real very quickly. Uh, it took them about uh, took them about two months to move over <laughs> to uh, all of their living data being delivered to uh, Hadoop in an archival mode, and then, uh, well, to be fair, the movement of their archives continues today, um, and they've been at it for about two years because it takes just as long to read it off tapes to put it in Hadoop as it did to tape it and retape it in the first place. But. Okay. So you're saying they don't you basically go and do away with the whole premise of archiving, and you're just simply saying that the data can then be stored in the Hadoop cluster for longer term. Yep. Uh, in so their case, possible. they're looking forever, um, or you know, functionally forever, because uh, they can just throw nodes at it. Okay. Um, so it's all based on the cost savings of the cost per terabyte per disk in a Hadoop node. Which versus? Or in three Hadoop nodes. Versus tape. Versus tape. Right, versus tape. Right. Okay. Or actually, versus states and versus their their existing six Our months being kept in Teradata, right? So they reduced the footprint in Teradata <coughs> to one month, um, because beyond one month, the half life of the data is no longer valid uh, for anything other than an archival, uh, you know, a, a, an analytic workload. Right? I'm doing something that is now a report on history anyway, um, and I can do that with MapReduce. So uh, they were able to reduce their territory footprint substantially as well. Thank you. Yeah, I have two questions. Sure. Um, the two clusters, were they in different locations? Yes. Um, second question is, does it, that $300 per terabyte, does that include um, like power, data center costs? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Networking? Yep. Okay. Um, and you know, they get big economies of scale of the size of their cluster that they got. Uh, Rebuilt their data center to be uh, green cooling and green power and blah blah blah. So they were able to drive a lot of that out, um, sort of in lockstep. So some of that number is fudge, uh, but not the two orders of magnitude is fudge. So my last use case, this is my favorite use case. Uh, who knows what a dark pool is? Okay, so a handful of people. Uh, these are sketchy, quasi-legal things, but uh, the, apparently, and I am not, uh, I'm not a banker by trade, I am an engineer by trade, but apparently, they are a mechanism for big IVs to move uh, assets around to ensure their own liquidity without affecting the price of the market. So uh, my value at risk is too high, so I need to increase my liquidity or else the regulators are gonna come after me, so I need to get these 20,000 shares of Apple off my books and somewhere else so I can increase my liquidity. But I want to do so in a way that doesn't tank the price of Apple. So uh, Investment Bank 1 will sell 20,000 shares of Investment Bank 2 to Investment Bank 2, and they'll push around this liquidity and the shell game happens. And somehow this doesn't affect the price of the markets. Okay. Um, one of the challenges with that is that they are really trying to preserve the anonymity of the traders um, because they want, don't want to affect the price of the market. Um, what that also means is there's a bunch of algorithmic systems in there that are trying to sound the dark pole to figure out how much liquidity is currently uh, uh, in movement, uh, what is the going rate for a big swap of, of uh, Apple, uh, and how Thanks, uh, I'm Adam Google. How do I train my algorithmic trading systems to, uh, to best take 
advantage of movements in liquidity in the markets. Uh, huge volumes of these fixed messages I mentioned earlier. Uh, Lots and lots of data, lots of it's unstructured. Fix is a semi-structured format that changes its structure um, every message. Uh, and they sort of look like this. Um, so a new order will have uh, a set of fields on it. Uh, it'll be responded to by a bunch of people rejecting that, a bunch of people uh, accepting it and, and allowing for new, um, and then somebody trying to partial fill it at some price. And every one of those message types has different content. Uh, and every one of those trading systems can be trading with a different version of FIX for some reason, because apparently this was cooked up in a, in a closet before engineering happened. But anyway. Uh, <laughs> um, and then if I want to change the price or I want to change the amount, uh, another replace request, you know, a whole bunch of messages, you sort of get this big massive tree of messages. And as a dark pool operator, I have a cost associated with every one of these messages that comes through my dark pool. And if somebody is generating tens of thousands or twenties of thousands or hundreds of thousands of these messages, trying to sound my dark pool and figure out how much liquidity is floating around in it, that costs me money. And if, they're not, if they are not actually executing trades at the end of it, that costs me money and I don't need any commission. And that means there's a bunch of people out there with algorithmic trading systems that I want to change my terms and conditions with. Um, and this was a very real case that they were looking to do. And so, uh, what they needed to do was create uh, these order families. So they needed to traverse the whole stack of these messages to identify all of these families of messages that are a whole bunch of discrete, uh, a whole bunch of discrete events that need to be tied together uh, across a parent-child relationship uh, with end depth, um, and determine all of the ones that are ending in cancellations that are very large above some threshold, and then identify patterns in the folks who were doing that um, and try to look. Uh, you know, we want to run you know, fast furriers on it to determine if it's being uh, machine generated. We want to take a look and see if uh, this is just something that is a pattern of bad behavior from human actors. Uh, is it our own internal systems that are causing us a ton of money, which by the way it was. And, <laughs> um, and uh, it's a fairly complex problem. Um, so what they wound up doing eventually, they started by, we're going to build a bunch of MapReduce. They built a bunch of MapReduce that traversed those families, ran n times until they walked the whole day's worth of messages and then materialized that back in sequence files. Um, and then they wrote a bunch of, uh, they, they wrote a bunch of pig to try and digest those sequence files and look for these patterns. And it took them something on the order of four months and two consulting projects. Um, and they balled that up and rolled it up. Didn't work with. Um, they brought Datamir in. I plugged in this fix, uh, the, the results of their original tree traversal. Um, so I kept the work they had already done um, to do the tree traversal and then slotted in all the analytics on top of that. So they essentially walked it back to its topmost root pattern using raw map produce, uh, materialized that into a loop, and then exposed it to their end users to do whatever pattern analysis they wanted to do with it. Um, using the data mirror tool, which if we have time, I can show you guys. Um, and, uh, and we're able to expose something on the order of uh, about 40 contracts that they wanted to renegotiate to change terms and conditions to increase um, their cost per, uh, per essentially execution. Questions? Thoughts? Comments? Mm -hmm. Rob Fruit? <laughs> Sounds like uh, Datamir is mostly an ETL tool. Are there, if it happens to have convenient connectors to Hadoop, are there other pieces to it? So uh, that is just one bit of it. So we do ETL um, on ELT. Um, we also provide, so I'll show you um, rather than trying to answer the question. Um, we provide a head to your data, to your Hadoop cluster. Uh, this is Datamir. Um, we can get you data. So I can go and say I want to load data from wherever, my, my SQL, my S3, my web service connector, whatever, my SSH. Uh, it's a batch log, it's in, in here, blah, 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 parse pattern. Then we go and get the scheduling system and security system so you can sort of secure the perimeter. Um, you can change what we're landing, so if I don't want log name, and I want, uh, and I 
don't, uh, I don't want this to be data on the string. I can change it. Uh, I can change how we partition it. Say so I want to start a partition based on the actual events in my clickstream by day. Uh, change how often I want it to run. What do I want to do with the data? Do I want to keep it? And so on. And then we wake up the cluster. And submit a MapReduce job to it. Native MapReduce task happens under the hood. In this case, we break it up based on the initial size uh, into a set of shards, and each one of those shards gets read by a map task and landed as a sequence file. In it. What we also do is sample that data. So uh, we pass through the data, we created a 5,000 record sample for every partition that we found, um, and now as an end user, I can start to immediately interact with that data in a spreadsheet. Um, so anybody who's ever used Excel can start to manipulate that data. So if I wanted to, I could say, I only care our status equals 200, and request contains .html. What we do here is run an in-memory MapReduce job on the sample data that we collected. Uh, essentially, you build up the set of stuff that you're trying to do, you get some feedback around what it's like to look like, and then we push it down and run it in the cluster as a series of average tasks. Question? Sure, two questions. Not the back of this uh, but So, the, the data are living in, uh, in HBase? Is that a sort of, are there like proprietary formats? It lives in raw sequence files on the HBase. Sequence files in what format? Well, format. It's a it's a standard sequence text format with some metadata that we read at the top. And where does Damien live? Uh, is it like on every node? No, uh, we live in a we live in the appliance node, the edge node, the node alongside your cluster that sends stuff to it. Shut it down. Um, so we use S3 as our storage in that case. Um, yeah, and we spin up the EMR whenever we have it, and then uh, if we run out of workload, we shut it down. So yeah, we'll orchestrate to that as well. Okay, so S3 instead of Yes, uh, in that case, uh, which of course increases latency, but uh, depending on what you're doing, that may not matter. Um, and so we give you this whole sort of formula builder idiom. Anybody who's ever used Excel sits down in front of it pretty much immediately. Uh, you can start doing things like grouping that by my user, and I want to session that data, so I'm going to do group by gap from the timestamp. If I see any other clicks in 20 minutes, I'll consider that the same session. Um, and give me the max for that session. Sample data. Now I'm done, and I can do joins there, and I can bring multiple data sets together there. I can use workbooks as sources to other workbooks, so I can sort of materialize pieces of it along the way. Uh, choose what I want to materialize into a dupe, and then I can also set it up to slave to the original jobs. How many data sets do I want to keep? All the rules around um, data retention and storage. And then kick it off as a series of map reduce tasks. Uh, we do a fair amount of uh, optimization. So if I was doing a join here, and one of the join sides is small enough to put it in memory, I'll do an in-memory map side join on that um, to reduce the amount of reducers that we'll do um, because we have a fair amount of knowledge about the data that we import it. Uh, we don't have to import the data. We can leave it in place, we can link to it, and so on. And the last bit that we have is some visualization. So visualization is a WYSIWYG HTML5 driven visualization being fed directly out of HDFS. Um, it's uh, based on D3, um, so it scales nicely and I can pull pieces of it off and change how we aggregate it and so on. That is the super short data and we can also export it. So um, 
all of our data can be bi-directional. <coughs> get it and then land it. Question. Um, feature for feature, how do you uh, see your product standing up or uh, facing off against like Tableau and the things that they offer? So uh, the difference between us and Tableau is Tableau looks down a straw at your data because at the end of the day it's memory driven uh, and we're not. So when we run the data, we run it against all the data. Um, all your aggregations can be prepared here and you can get feedback about it uh, in line. And we don't necessarily act like we're going to compete directly with Tableau. You know, the whole reason for export out of the database, uh, out of the Hadoop, back into a database is, all right, I've got my sample set or my materialized set prepared, and I'm going to deliver that to my Tableau users in a relational data model or Hive. Following on that question, Will, <clears throat> is it usually cleared through creating a, a result set database, or do you have any level of like contemplated direct integration? We are trying to eat their lunch, so we're not going to directly integrate. Um, so it's generally around landing in a neutral okay. place. Would you say Datamir is more like an ETL? Does ETL work? You know, there are really two, there's really three constituents that use Datamir. There's an admin group that is building and normalizing or denormalizing data. Uh, they do ETL and, and materialize those workflows. There's an analyst group that's doing ad hoc analytics. Uh, on top of the stuff that has already been MDM'd in top inside data here. So they'll reuse the workbooks downstream that have been prepared by admin um, and do whatever the heck they need to do with it. Um, you know, digest it, discover patterns, look for um, you know, look for geolocation anal analyses, um, build networks of of, uh, of important actors, for instance. Um, and then there's a bunch of decision makers who can only consume charts because they don't understand the data really. Um, so there's sort of three users and we kind of mix and match them. Um, we don't really believe that it's valid to divorce ETL from query um, because invariably you get the, hi, I need a different data set. Do you have a budget? Well, no, we'll go pound sand. Um, yeah, and, uh, you know, we looked at really create as much integration with that as possible. That's why we allow users to upload files um, directly into Hadoop through Datamere to say, I've got my Excel with my 100 accounts on it that I'm interested in, and I want to join that against the big data set. Um, so you know, I'm going to reuse pieces of it and then expand on it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, you, uh, so how does it differ from, I can see a few things, but can you tell us how it differs from uh, Pintado data integration? Well, uh, mainly in that it's a query engine, not just an ETL. Um, I mean, so to the, I was answering this question to Troy, who was my, my sales guy earlier. Um, how do we, who do we consider our competition uh, changes based on the problem you're trying to solve? Uh, so if you're trying to solve ETL, Pintado is very much competitive. Um, and if that's your only problem that you're trying to solve, Pentado is probably better off because you got to do a nice little graphical view of dragging these things together. And um, if they're the only constituent who's ever going to be using your Hadoop cluster, you have sold your Hadoop cluster short. Um, so you know, the fact that you can do the ETL and you can expose that to end users who can then supplement that ETL and do their own query and analytics and do their own visualization and pipe that out to SaaS because they want to do a bunch of risk of modeling and, and analytics there uh, really sort of expands the footprint beyond ETL. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Other questions? Ha have you done any um, plan? Has Datamir done any uh, playing around with using the um, Pala engine? In so it's kind of a sensitive subject. <clears throat> sensitive for who? For the boss man. Uh, Stefan thinks SQL is an abortion in, uh, in Hadoop. Um, if you guys are familiar, Stefan Groshoff is one of the original contributors to Nudge. He's been doing that for nine years. He's got very strong opinions. Um, the other thing is that there's a bunch of Wikipedia technologies. Right? There's Dremel and Drill. Yeah, yeah. I, I um, mean, sort of the whole class, the whole of, them. class of them. Versus like MapReduce. And we have. Or does it? We have this star wagon of MapReduce, and that is not likely to change anytime soon. Okay. Um, okay. 
Yeah, that's, that's, what, I, that's what I got for you. So <laughs> SQL is what you, or what the boss man says it is. What is the answer? Oh, the answer is that Hadoop acts like mainframes. It's the real reality, right? It's a sequential, it's a, it's a sledgehammer, right? Um, and set theory and sequential analytics both have a place. Um, and parallelism with set theory isn't great. And uh, <laughs> and then you wind up with a lot of weird stuff, like you can't do not in because you don't have an index. That doesn't work. Because um, universe to universe comparisons on every row sucks. Um, and there's a place for SQL and set, and set analytics and OLTP and, and relationals are very, very good at that. And continuing to try and weld SQL on top of uh, d distributed, uh, distributed parallel computing is a crutch for people who don't want to learn how to deal with sequential analytics. Um, no offense to the Hive guy, but he feels that way about Hive too. Uh, <laughs> I don't necessarily share his opinion, but um, increasingly, we were actually talking to Phil Shelley over at, uh, at Sears today. Uh, increasingly, the sort of the promise of we will finally get off the mainframe and all of our <coughs> sequential ETL stuff that happens there, happens in data stage, happens in, uh, in, in Informatica, can be moved to cheap commodity hardware and done uh, very, very simply and very, very fast. And a lot of that processing that we're doing for ledgering that has to touch every row, or uh, archival history that has to touch every row, and therefore set theory isn't even appropriate, um, is what it was for, and just because you have a hammer, everything's on a nail. So it's not an answer, but that's our party line. <laughs> uh, is Datamere open source and or is there a crippled open source version? Uh, no and no. Uh, there is a for free trial, and if you want to research, that's for free as well. Yeah, I think we shall a couple of presentations. So is the Datamere purely based on MapReduce, or is there any other country? We are just not. We do MapReduce under the hood, but we will go get your data from wherever. So everything we do under the hood is MapReduce, but we'll get it from high or HPACE or whatever. Uh, if you have pig outputs, we'll read those and use them. Uh, you know, we're pretty easy going with regards to the sort of larger Hadoop community, but uh, our underlying engine is uh, is MapReduce, uh, and that might be our answer for Apollo eventually. Is that we use it as another data source. Is, is, is the HPACE integration with MapReduce direct, or is it a copy to HPACE? That's correct. Okay. Yeah. So, can you showed us the GUI. Are there other ways to interact with Kennedy? Not really. Uh, there's a REST API, so you can generate stuff. Uh, you know, all of these things in the header, um, JSON. Right? So you can generate objects and build them yourself and execute stuff. Um, and there's also an SDK, so if you want to plug stuff in, you can write uh, file types and import job, uh, connector types and workbook functions and whatnot. Um, they are not MapReduce coding, they are just Java. We manage all the parallelism inside uh, Datamere, that's sort of our secret sauce, um, and push that down for execution. It's also how we do integration with R. Um, we'll you know, manage the parallelism and the aggregation and feed that down to R on, on all the task nodes. So R is going to be on your task notes, but now you're not dealing with like Revolution R, you know, that really is R. So you're trying to use the regular free version of R? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so we are using the regular free version of R. We don't require Revolution MapReduce R. Along that line, so, so you can deploy analytics on this? Sure. You just load up some code and whatever is on each node and then you can run it? Yep. Essentially, you wind up getting a function that is R aggregation. You feed it some R code. We run that on every node against the data set we feed it. So you can do, uh, you know, use data to group by year, group by month, um, take the 30 days as a group series, um, feed the results of those 30 days as observations to a cross correlation function, get the cross correlation function back from R, uh, and take the R, the R squared out of uh, the JSON response and do something else with it in the workbook. But we've also done things like integrate the Miller updating regression and a couple of other things. Anything else?